Um, thanks for coming out. We're uh, going to do demos after the panel session. So my name's Don Anderson. I'm one of the co-founders of the Asian VR Association. There's two of us who are co-founders and three of us who are actually on the board. Uh, we're always looking for more people to help out to organize these types of events. You probably heard the oot in there. Yes, I'm Canadian. Um, it's the way it goes. So, Tonight's session, we're really just going to talk about VR and AR, sort of kind of a, uh, a more of a debate approach. But before we get into it, I just want to thank a few people. The NUS uh, Enterprise team have always helped us out in terms of a location to do this. Um, so we need to give them a bit of a, a thanks there. We also want to thank, obviously, our demoing companies. Thank you so much. Uh, if you haven't tried out yet, uh, do get out there after the session and, and try the HCC Vive. Uh, we've got some amazing stuff in terms of Asia, of uh, animation and VR. That's like I think a first. Are you guys like the first doing it? That we know of. That you know <laughs> of. <laughs> All right. So if you haven't done that, do that. Try that. Um, so again, what are we? The Asian VR Association is as informal as it is informal as you possibly could be. It's a non-profit association focusing on promoting dialogue, debate, collaboration, and investment in this rapidly evolving area of technology and innovation. We're really doing this just to help promote the industry. So it's uh, it's a you know hackathons every so often, every two months we try to do some form of meetup and gathering like this. Um, and we really like your proactive support. So if you've got ideas, submit them to us. Right? We've got a Facebook page, uh, a group that you can submit ideas, join it, find out all the guys on there and the people that are actually uh, in the group are adding all kinds of comments on a regular basis. And, uh, and sharing information. Um, we're getting a lot of intrigue and interesting uh, comments from around the region too as well, from Australia to China to you name it. So there's obviously a lot of momentum in this space and we'll talk about that in a bit here in a second. Um, and as I said, the format of the evening, we changed things up a bit. Roy suggested we do, a, uh, you know, go more in terms of demos and focus on a panel session, which we're doing. We'll run this for about 30 to 40 minutes. We'll take your questions. Let's make it interactive. We had a good debate the last time out, so let's make this one just as, uh, as the same. Uh, Demo Wing Companies, VR Collab, Blipper, um, and Warrior 9, thank you so much, guys, for taking the effort to, can we give them a round of applause? Bit of, bit of work to put it together. Particularly setting up the agency vibe, right? <laughs> uh, panel introductions. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Ariel for coming out, founder and MD of Takanto uh, Virtual Reality. Chris Bell, uh, Business Director for APAC for Blipper. Uh, Max from uh, his creative, uh, creative Director, Eon Reality. And Mithru came in for uh, RGA at the last minute. Thanks so much. And RGA is a uh, agency. So what I'm going to do is each uh, uh, panelist is going to take three to five minutes to talk a little bit about what they do, what their company does, and explain what their interest is in this whole space. So one by one. Take it away, Ariel. Okay. Thanks. So, hello everyone, my name is Ariel. I'm the founder of Takanto Virtual Reality. Takanto is one of the first VR production companies in Singapore. Uh, we've been working over the last two years with leading global brands. We've been working with Flight Center to introduce the first travel industry VR experience in stores in Asia. Uh, we're actually having the, we have the Flight Center VR marketing manager over there as well um, today. Uh, so Takanto is uh, basically, it started as a production company focusing again on creating VR experiences for the travel and tourism industries. We've expanded to some other verticals <coughs> over the last uh, year. We're going to launch a few projects with leading airlines uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, on top of doing productions, we also offer advanced interactivity layer so we are able to put a layer of interactivity additional information on videos to allow some of the more educational industry related kind of uh, um, applications um, other than that I think basically that's that's it so again production interactivity on top of videos and the sky's the limit maybe AR in a year or two. Mm -hmm. nice. Chris you want to give her a shot? Yeah, great. So Chris from Blipper. Um, so Blipper is a visual discovery app. Um, and essentially within, with our platform or app, we um, allow people to point their phone at objects or items or brands um, and unlock content um, or augmented reality experiences. Um, so we, we work with um, a lot of the biggest brands globally. Um, 
to the likes of P&G, Nestle, uh, Unilever, Pepsi, Coca-Cola. Um, we also work with some of the biggest publishers, um, so Condé Nast, uh, Time, um, as well as partnering with some of the um, biggest celebs, the most famous celebs. So we've uh, done some work with Justin Bieber and One Direction. I guess, you know, not forgetting as well some of the education work that we do globally as well. So we have uh, 50,000 teachers um, globally that, that, um, that are using Blipper in the, pla in the classroom to, to help enable the, um, the learning experience and, uh, and enhance that using augmented reality. Um, so uh, in, in Asia Pac, we have uh, had an office in, in Japan and India for two years. Um, and we most recently launched our office in Singapore as the regional hub seven months ago. So, um, so we've seen, we've had a lot of really great traction here um, and great appetite from the glo regional global brands that we work with. Um, and I think you know specifically in this region, we're seeing a real um, uptake around the the behaviour that we're trying to create, which is essentially people pointing their phone at things and blipping things. Uh, so blipping is essentially our verb. Um, and we we really put that down to the fact that. In Southeast Asia, people are very much mobile first, and uh, they use their mobile in a, in a very different way than other parts of the world. And um, you know, we see that as a big opportunity for ourselves here in uh, this region. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we've got a booth over there, so uh, if you haven't seen the demos already, then come over after this. <coughs> Hi guys, I'm Mitru. Uh, I'm here from RGA. RGA is an advertising agency. Um, the reason I'm here, I'm a software engineer, but the reason I'm here is I'm kind of the understudy for my uh, my boss, the tech director, uh, Laurent. Uh, Laurent's um, unfortunately in Shanghai at the moment, um, but that doesn't discount the kind of discussions that we have. Uh, so for the most part, I, I joined RG about three months ago for their prototype uh, studio. Uh, the prototype studio just launched in Singapore. We um, we explore different technologies. I'm more of an explorer, um, explore different technologies, how exactly uh, we, we can use them in advertising. So uh, the potential partnerships with people like Blippar, uh, for example, um, and, and that's, that's basically my role. Um, previously, my experience with VR and AR, in a previous agency, we did uh, experiment uh, and we did build um, uh, systems to augment or rather extend the capabilities of existing VR uh, platforms. We built a, this was last year, early last year that we built a uh, kind of like a smell, uh, this, uh, we added scent to VR uh, where we, uh, so essentially with different scenes there would be different scents and this was for, a, it was still an advertising agency that I worked at Maxis um, and, and yeah so that was, that was one. Another one was uh, <coughs> about having your hands, so, so basically a view through where you could actually see your hands within virtual reality. We used uh, the Leap Motion for that. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, not too bad uh, um, in terms of experience with VR, I'd say. Uh, but yeah, uh, and, and that's basically it for me. All right, one thing, uh, can everybody hear back there? One thing you need to do is just to hold it. The mics aren't that sensitive, unfortunately, so mm -hmm. you gotta really put it up there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Max. <laughs> Hi. Okay, I'm uh, Maxim. Uh, I work for a company called uh, Eon Reality. Um, so Eon Reality has been active for actually uh, 17 years. So it's a pretty old VR uh, company, uh, and uh, it started uh, some time ago uh, with, uh, I would say, systems like caves. I don't know if uh, some people are familiar with caves or if, or if you've been in any of those. So it's. Uh, um, I speak with my hands. <laughs> uh, so it's um, a four walls uh, display, uh, use four projectors, it's a very uh, heavy footprint. Um, so we've, uh, we've done uh, VR with uh, domes, with, uh, with scales, uh, with uh, lots of different uh, sort of uh, immersive displays. Um, and uh, I joined this company uh, three years ago. Um, what we do, uh, the type of clients that we have uh, are essentially in education, so we do a lot of uh, vocational training and I think uh, that's where uh, VR has been uh, very efficient for, um, for a long time. Uh, doing simulators for, uh, to train pilots, for example, um, or doing uh, simulators to train uh, all rig operators or to train uh, uh, people to do uh, aircraft maintenance. So this is a, a really our core, uh, our core knowledge to train uh, people to, to, to do those things. Um, now, right now, our, um, our company is uh, moving more towards the mobile technologies, of course. 
um, and, uh, and we are developing a, a mobile application for K12 uh, called Young Experience uh, AVR. And um, it's uh, an application that we allocate kids to experience uh, 3D content in augmented reality and in virtual reality. And we are betting a lot on uh, the development of technologies like uh, Tango, for example. Um, and that's it. Cool. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, so as I said, let's make this interactive. If you have any questions throughout, just shoot your hand up and, uh, and fire away. Um, so let's talk about augmented reality versus re uh, virtual reality. Uh, of yourselves, who is in favor of either or? Do you want to take this area? Would you? Oh, go for it. Oh, no. So, I, I mean, for me, for the most part, I think Mike. it's... Sorry. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Um, personally, I mean, I'm more biased towards augmented reality just as a result of it being um, a lot more, at least, at least in 2016, a lot more functional. Uh, virtual reality is a lot more expressive. I mean, that's the, uh, I studied at LaSalle, so that's the artist in me kind of speaking and saying, you know what, no, um, fun to hell with functionality, be creative, go all out with virtual reality. So, but yeah, I mean, like in terms of function, I would still be AR, creativity, VR. Yeah. Aaron, what do you think of that? We know what you think, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back. Well, I, yeah. I would say I refuse to answer this question the way it's phrased at the moment, because yeah. I think the answer is really different depending on on two key parameters, the industry of course, but I would even say the way you want to use it, because I look at three key pillars, I would say. There is the marketing pillar, there is the business pillar, and there is the entertainment pillar. And then you need to break it down to industries, and I think it's a different answer for each one of those uh, industries or verticals. So even though I'm very biased towards VR production, and yet Takanto, we need to be real here. You know, there are a lot of business uses for, for AR, definitely entertainment oriented uh, use cases so I would say you know different answers for different industries. Chris you were going to add to that. Yeah sure I mean obviously I'm going to go in the AR camp right uh, being from Blipper but um, but I think I think for me I think the, the time for VR will come um, it will develop over the next five years um, obviously and um, and I think I think the way I look at it right now is um, is how many people have virtual reality headsets at home right now uh, probably very little, um, whereas essentially everyone has a smartphone. Um, but I think you know one of some of the things we're looking at at Blipper is um, is essentially investing in what we're calling mixed reality. So essentially um, embedding augmented reality type technologies into headsets and glasses. So actually using that technology in a sort of mixed um, mixed reality type field, um, which I think, to be honest, is probably going to be the the next phase before really um, VR takes off as a as a mass uh, consumerized product, um, but I mean absolutely agree that there is um, huge benefit in what br VR brings to the table now in specific uh, sectors. Um, is it powerful right now from a marketing ROI point of view? Then I, I'm, I'm not sure, right? But uh, but I think um, from an entertainment or uh, storytelling or uh, movies kind of uh, space, and I think it's super powerful. I actually agree with that. You kind of raise your eyebrows there for a second. Um, yeah. Well, I actually tend to disagree. Um, I think there are more people who actually have um, VR headsets than people who have AR headsets uh, at home. Uh, even though uh, right now you can experience AR with a mobile phone, um, mobile, mobile phones are definitely not the best way to experience AR. Um, I think uh, at the same time I saw the Gipa demo, I, I like it a lot. Um, I think the, the access to data uh, through image, I mean, just by scanning something, I think, I think this is great. Uh, but the overlay of, uh, of uh, images on top of, uh, of our reality, uh, I think this is very gimmicky. I don't know if that's the right word in English. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the reality is already very cluttered and we don't need to, to add more advertising to it. Uh, I think uh, it would be great if we could remove the advertising from our reality. Um, so yeah, that's my point of view. Yeah. <laughs> so what about the substantive, what, what are the differences for those who really may not be as well acquainted with this space as yourselves, what are the differences between the two? Between? Between VR and AR in terms of experience. Oh wow, well, okay. Um, well, VR, uh, the, the, the ultimate goal of VR is to actually hijack all, all your senses. So right now we are uh, just hijacking the sound and uh, and uh, the the sight, the view, you know. Uh, but uh, in AR uh, we are just 
I mean, AR, which uh, I'd rather say mixed reality. We are just uh, hijacking in certain senses, or just actually part of your senses. So we can uh, augment your your, uh, your environment by adding some sounds, or augment your environment by adding some visuals, or by moving some. That's it. Well, Ariel, you mentioned before, um, you might want to pass the mics around too as well. Um, any particular industries that you feel VR is more relevant than others, than AR perhaps, and vice versa? Yeah, so um, I do believe that there are certain industries that VR is more relevant than AR. By the way, I also disagree with this, uh, with being diplomatic, honestly, I think VR is by far better now compared to AR, but I do see AR getting momentum in five years, so I, don't, I think, you know, if we look at VR and AR, AR has been around for several years already, it didn't really get out of momentum, now it's riding, you know, piggybacking the VR high, that's what I feel. But again, five years from now, definitely, I think you'll have your, uh, your uh, room. In terms of verticals, uh, well, as, as mentioned, I think uh, uh, the travel and tourism industries really embrace that, hospitality as well, you know, the Marriott Hotel brand, Flight Center, Thomas Cook, uh, and other tra draft travel groups uh, globally, I'm not sure if familiar with the names, in the Middle East as well, um, because this justifies being fully immersed in a different environment, as opposed to getting a layer of additional info on top of something else. So I would say travel and tourism is definitely more VR oriented. Uh, on the other hand, for uh, AR, I, I'd like to give you the, the mic for that, but just my take on, on AR, additional layer, it's for a day-to-day -day kind of, from a business perspective, day-to-day -day kind of uh, um, uh, jobs of maintenance, for example, pilots, you know, there is a very advanced helmet for pilots where you can actually see info projected in front of you, so it's more practical for those kind of uh, applications, I would say. Yeah. Do you want to talk to that, Chris? Yeah, I mean, from an AI point of view, so we, we work at scale with uh, a lot of, you know, consumer goods companies, packaged goods, F&B companies. And um, and I think you know what we what we talk about a lot is essentially how marketeers have forgotten about the power of their product, right? So you know, I guess one of the, the things to hammer home is the fact that there's more products out there um, that are sold every day than there are YouTube views, Google Google view Google searches, and also Facebook likes combined, right? So there's billions and billions of SKUs out there, right? So within with AR technology, that can now each piece. A gateway into a content experience, a utility, or even a repurchase purchase decision. Right, so that's for me where the power of AR is right now. Is creating those utilities and digital services on top of brands versus sending someone through to a website, um, and also creating a, an opportunity to cross sell and resell to a, to a person who's already bought a brand. That's right. From your um, perspective, from an agency perspective, what are you focusing it on at RGA? Are you looking at AR? VR independently or together when you're working with brands? I think we're looking at them independently, and that's a personal take. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're looking at them independently purely because they're different experiences altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, just as a result of, like, you know, virtual reality, yes, like, you know, there are some really amazing campaigns out there. And at the same time, uh, augmented reality, as uh, Blipar does. And, and I think they're, compl they're two different tracks altogether. And I don't think at least agencies should look, the look at them. Uh, in uh, in in a singular kind of or put them in the same kind of bucket. Right. Um, I mean, yes, there there is like it's not it's not it's not a complete black and white kind of scenario. It is there is a very gray area. But uh, a personal take is that it's it's uh, right now at least for the agency it's 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 quite uh, distinct and we should be looking at it in a relatively distinct way. So what are you favoring though? Are you pitching one over the other or? I, right now because well the hype is in v on VR right so it has to be VR definitely yeah. there's absolutely no way but again I mean like you know just before we move on I have a question for Ariel in that sense like uh, yes you did talk about uh, experiences you did talk about uh, like uh, flight, flight simulators for example or uh, like you know in airport experiences and whatnot but what are your thoughts on the fatigue that happens, like you know, yes, you try it out, and then would you try it out again? You, you try it out a couple of times, but beyond that, you you would have to create new experiences for sure, right? And it's not, and content here isn't like a video where videos we used to we will watch different types of videos, and it's still it's still going to be there. But these are experiences; they're not creating content pieces. So I absolutely agree that this would have been a concern if companies like Samsung and Google and Facebook would have have embraced that. Uh, so strongly. 
but since you know now you're gonna have consumer ready uh, 360 cameras and Facebook is all about 360 pictures 360 videos so it's being pushed so aggressively um, in a way that I believe will ensure at least for the next several years that it will get momentum so uh, content actually it's a concern from companies for companies like my company in a way you know because we produce high-end kind of uh, VR experiences but then what will happen if everyone will be able to capture the same kind of content so we are not concerned about the lack of content We're concerned about being able to, sh to differentiate to um, be innovative in terms of an added value on top of the content that there is today Actually, when, when you look at um, this space too as well, in terms of, we talked about this yesterday when we caught up at your office, you, this becoming more ubiquitous and in terms of adoption. We talked about the phase of evolution. Where do you think we are right now? Oh, well, right you now, I mean, it's, uh, we're still in the womb, actually. Uh, it's uh, the very early beginning. We have seen nothing. Uh, it's going to be, I mean, just don't get me wrong. I, I really believe in AR, actually. I think uh, something will come. But uh, the technology is just not there yet. Uh, it will be maybe five years, uh, probably. Can I ask, how many of you actually have headsets, VR headsets at home? Raise your hands. Oh, it's quite a few. Yeah, not bad, and pretty much weighted on this side here. Um, all right, let's break that down then. Cardboard type sets. Okay. I'm not saying that because I work for Google. Um, <laughs> Oculus Rift, HTC Vive, still niche. Yeah. That's That's and gear, 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 of course, we got Samsung here. <laughs> wow. And there you are. Surprising, yeah. Yeah, bad. And then let's talk about AR. How many of you use AR on a regular basis? Sorry, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's not about putting you on the spot. Um, be interesting why you think that is at this moment. Um. I mean, it's, 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 to be honest, it's very much aligned to the direction that Blip is moving into now. So, um, you know, I think the, the comments around AR has been around for a few years and uh, has, you know, come and gone, come and gone, um, it's fair. Um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of cool wow experiences that brands have built um, to take that innovation budget, uh, sorry, to take that innova innovation box within their marketing plan, right? Um, and at Blip, we're really, we're trying to move away from that now, right, to create utility. Um, for those brands, um, which is really why we've completely flipped our business model now, right? So, so right in my introduction at the beginning, I talked to, uh, about us as a visual discovery app, right? So we're actually using um, a mix of artificial intelligence and computer vision technology and augmented reality as a content me uh, delivery mechanism um, to essentially overlay content onto real-world objects, right? But there's a, there's a difference in the way we're positioning ourselves now. We're an AI engine versus an augmented reality engine, right? So, um, so we believe merging those technologies together um, will give um, give a real utility to consumers. Um, so, I think you know, in a year's or hope in a year's time, that there'll be a lot more hands up in the room because there'll be a daily usage for you to um, use an app like Lipper, um, and that's really the journey we're on now is to drive that ubiquitous behavior of people blipping. Just as people Google things, um, we want people to use Lipper as a visual search tool, essentially. And then when they see a brand like Coca-Cola, they blip it and they get a really cool AR experience. Um, so that's where we're going as a, from a business point of view. How does one make money from AR and VR? I can go, if you go for it. So I mean, currently we, um, and, and have done them for the last four years, uh, make money through production, right? So we produce um, uh, augmented reality experiences using our platform. Um, and in the future that will change as we move into more of a sort of visual discovery AI space. Um, there'll be sort of media media type engines baked on top of that. Um, and that will come out in the next sort of six months or so. Um, but but yeah, purely production at this stage. Excellent. Well, um, as a, for us, um, it's been essentially a niche market, as I said. So, um, it's uh, by uh, establishing partnership with uh, uh, educational institution with regions. Um, so um, we partner with universities and we uh, install uh, centers there, where we uh, train uh, certain workforce. So that's what I was describing earlier, simulators. 
uh, for example, uh, one uh, that we have is in uh, IT, uh, right here in Singapore. Um, and uh, we use it to train uh, all rig workers, all rig operators. Uh, and we put them inside a, a huge white room and then we turn off the light. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and then they are transported in, uh, on our rig and they have to uh, behave in a crisis scenario. Um, so, and well, that's it. So we said just a very expensive solution. As you are still changing much, though, we talked about this yesterday. You're one of the first in. You've been doing this for quite a while. Yeah, so yeah. you've had to adjust. Yeah, of course. So I think for us, uh, the big challenge is to uh, move towards uh, mass market, of course, right now. And uh, and uh, so, well, we're not going to be able to, to sell the technology anymore. So uh, what we can do is to create a distribution platform, that's what we're doing, uh, and focus on uh, uh, excellent content delivery. Uh, and I think the content will be, will be uh, uh, a key issue in the future. I think, uh, actually, Video game companies have a have a big uh, a big advantage right now. Yeah. Yeah. Carol, do you want to talk to that as well in terms of how you work with brands? Particularly, you've got the flight center here. How did that process? Yeah. Where do you start? So this is this is a challenge indeed to really put an ROI kind of model against an investment in virtual reality. So um, and, and, and by the way, I think that developers and startups should always keep that that in mind. Sometimes I see startups going for the cool stuff, never really asking themselves what kind of business use would that have. So um, the way we work with brands, so we actually did took the approach of, of um, trying to see VR as a business tool from the beginning, meaning it's not just about creating some sort of uh, experience customers will come in, put it on, wow, that's cool, Flight Center is all about travel, and then move on and talk to the consultant. We actually looked at it as a tool that will be used by consultants to sell destinations. So it can be destinations that people are aware of, but we will feature some hidden, hidden gems or hidden spots within those kind of destinations. We're gonna launch a, um, a clip on Gold Coast shortly. So Gold Coast is a destination that many people already know, but we will be featuring some, some, some places uh, around Gold Coast which are not that common or commonly known. Um, and also we look at how can we use VR, so each clip that is being produced is not just about being a sales tool for consultants, it's also about training consultants because right. you're a better salesperson when you actually know what you're selling. Because today you can't really send consultants all over the world to see all the different places. But if you can take them through a virtual reality experience, they'll be better salespeople in a way by being able to really talk about what they saw yeah. when they're trying to sell. So there are two different angles for that. Speaking specifically around the travel and tourism industry. Um, so how, to the travel piece, do you think that VR could be a substitute experience for that actual hands-on travel experience? Do you think we'll, we'll see people just sitting at home and not traveling in the future? That, that, that's a question that I think uh, flies, <laughs> she gets it all. Don't you a little worried about that? <laughs> So not at the moment. I mean, the quality is is not that good to really re replace the real life experience. We still we're still being cautious. We are not documenting places for more than uh, like one minute, so people will still yeah. feel as if they need to go there to explore. Um, in the future, maybe well, the, the hardware is changing. We're going to have 4K K phones. Maybe. Yeah. Actually, I think uh, one of the initiatives that um, um, that they had was to take their VR headsets to. Um, um, an elderly institute to really allow people who can't afford traveling to experience how it feels to be in Tokyo, in Vietnam. So, at the end, I do believe that there will be a way to sell holidays in a VR kind of complex. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to hear a software engineer's ex uh, opinion on this space in terms of what is required. What, in terms of talent, does this space need? I think one thing is, I mean, like it's it's still. I mean, like yes, it's been around for the past forty years, but only now has the hype come about, and to a degree where everybody is actually actually caring about it and actually uh, putting proper work in. By proper work, I mean I, I'm not to discount the past thirty years, but uh, by, like you know, in terms of user experience, in terms of how how the user feels, we're really going places. I think, like you know, because two years ago when I tried the the Oculus Rift, I felt like I was in 
Mario World, you know, it was, it was, no, I mean, literally, because it was, the thing was, uh, the resolution wasn't, wasn't as great as it is today, and in two years we've come that far, um, like, I used to get VR sickness very easily, and I think now, so that's the thing, I think in terms of actually improving the headsets, we have improved, and I think, uh, in terms of talent, you need to understand what exactly is happening, and in terms of even user experiences, right, you, you need to understand what's, how exactly, um, these how exactly content should be made yeah. for example i think uh, i did speak to a few people a couple of weeks ago and they were talking uh, in depth about transitions between scenes and i think and that was it, it completely blew my mind because it's something so simple and yet it was it they, they did it very well you know in terms of uh, cutting between scenes and that it does kind of distract your user if you don't do it right mm -hmm. so i think things like that um, like there are very tiny bits that you really need to focus on, like right from production to, uh, um, I mean the programming part anybody can pick up, but right. in terms of actual user experience, I think more, more focus on that is is required and is, is, is the case of this. But you're doing outdoor, you know, you're doing outdoor uh, exhibits, uh, exhibitions, uh, events and such too as well. How do you approach <coughs> that? Because that's a different type of content experience. So how do you program to that? Uh, with VR outdoor? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm sorry. I don't. It's more I, like pop-up type studios and type things too, as well. But I with guess. advertising, that that generally is the case. Don't yeah. I think? I mean, like just as a result of uh, um, of campaigns not yeah. not not having to exist for more than a couple of weeks at most. Right. I think just creating experiences just for that one, which is why the vibe would be really important or really important in that space. I'd say. So, uh, from your perspective of what you've seen in terms of experiences that are probably branded. Um, what have you seen that you're most uh, intrigued by, or that's really sort of piqued your interest? Um, I uh, outside in, of your own work. In, yeah, in, uh, <laughs> in terms of advertising, I uh, I haven't been fully impressed by um, any particular work, but there was this one particular artwork that I'm really, really that I, that that did intrigue me from a couple of years ago. Uh, it was by this Brazilian artist. I forgot his name, but he created this experience where people could. Um, um, exchange bodies for the most part. So essentially, both of them would be would, would wear a headset, and this was two years ago, mm -hmm. and it was a really surreal experience. I, I actually tried it out. It was really uh, and and sorry. In terms of advertising, there, there there is one that kind of popped up in my head just now. There was this um, Swedish um, brand, telco brand, that um, was. I think the campaign was about um, if you can't. I mean, if 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 a lag is unacceptable in real life, a lag should be unacceptable for the internet as well. And they did this VR piece where um, it was a live feed, but uh, with a lag of three seconds or so. Yeah. And uh, they got people. It was just a video, but it was really cool. I think like it was it was it was quite interesting the way they kind of brought it about and whatnot. And it was a very interesting. VR wasn't the story. It was a tool used to tell a story, and I think that's interesting. Yeah. What do you think? There's a lot of momentum. There's a lot of obviously a lot of interest. Um, do you think a lot of this is real, or is it still a lot of tire kicking? My personal belief is that it is it is hype at the moment because, like you know, last year we were talking about Internet of Things, and yes, it will be a, a big thing in two years. But where is it now, right? Yeah, I, I, it's still going on. Yes, don't get me wrong, it's still going on. But like you know, it's it it for the hype it was last year. Where is it today? Yeah, it's happening. But yeah, Maxim, you got a you got an opinion on that in terms of where we are, whether this is all real. Um, well, I think the, the thing with VR is that it's already uh, have, a, have a market uh, in the gaming uh, industry. Yeah. So uh, it will grow mm -hmm. very steadily. I don't think we'll see a, um, a, well, I, don't think, I think it's just going to grow steadily, really. Uh, now maybe the hype will, 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 will not be as much in the uh, advertising industry, I think, uh, for a while. Uh, uh, you will pitch uh, VR to your clients and say, oh, okay, you know, VR, our competitor did it last year, uh, and uh, we don't want it anymore. But um, uh, yeah, I think it's going to grow steadily, and uh, it's probably with, uh, um, with uh, the, the form factor that uh, is going to evolve uh, for the headset that uh, we're going to see a, a large adoption. Uh, I think right now, the, regarding the resolution, you were talking about the resolution, uh, it's around, I think, by 2020, that we will have a, a full resolution equal to the human eye. And so uh, by then, uh, I think the experiences will be quite compelling. So when we talk about uh, VR tourism, uh, yeah, uh, we'll be there definitely. Uh, 
Um, now, um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. What, what, what's going to sustain this, though? What industries are going to sustain this? Is it consumer? Is it B2B? The gaming industry will sustain that, yeah. I believe, initially. Uh, looking at VR and AR, I think VR is going to be around thanks to the gaming industry. But this is a very, a very, uh, trying to avoid the gimmicky perception of VR is, is happening now. I think it's, it's something that can be missed easily. So it's a very sensitive kind of area. So uh, I think that companies that work in the VR space around business applications should really be focused on showing the business value of VR to make sure companies will embrace it, not just as a gimmick. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we'll find it only in cinemas and, and, and gamers will use yeah. VR. That's also why I do believe that AR in the long run will have a better potential. Um, you know, people will still like to be able to communicate with the environment, I believe. Chris, you've traveled around uh, a lot of SEA and in, in Asia. What have you seen in terms of other markets uptake? Which markets are really leading this kind of push from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of um, uptake specifically in the likes of Thailand and Vietnam. Um, very much around sort of, um, you know, high sort of growing smartphone penetration and connectivity there and, and you know, a really sort of um, young user base there to, um, to adopt this new behavior. Um, but, I mean, I think, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take time to really take off as a ubiquitous behavior, right? So, um, and that's really the job that we've got over the next 12 months is to make that happen. And that's our mission here in the region to make you know to make sure that's ha that happens through campaigns and also uh, other activities we're going to be doing uh, further on in the year. Um, but um, but no, I mean I think you know I think you know some of the conversation are really interesting around VR and I think you know for me it, I think the danger that I see is that it falls into the same trap that AR did four years ago, right? That, or five years ago that it just becomes a gimmick and people try it or their clients have tried it or uh, their competitor and then they don't want to go back try it again. So I think, to your point just before, I think driving a business value from the start is, uh, is a key learning I think we can all take from the AR industry. Just add one yeah, more, uh, just what, maybe one more aspect <coughs> other than gaming industry and, and the business usage is the social VR. I'm not sure if you've, you've got a chance to experience that. <coughs> I think there is a massive potential in social VR where you can really be in a room with other people virtually and communicate with them. So, again, yeah, it has a lot of potential to be the key to the mass market, I believe. So uh, where do you think... I'd like to add also that uh, uh, VR has been a long, a long around for, for quite a while, and uh, it's proved that it was useful. Now it was just very expensive, and no one had, ac had access to it, and uh, now it's becoming accessible, uh, and it doesn't have anything to prove. What markets, though, going back to the question, how do you think Singapore fits into all of this? We've got a lot of people showing up to these meetings, uh, and they continue to grow. Um, a lot of companies coming out too as well, getting a bit more profile. Uh, where are we in that ecosystem in terms of capabilities, uh, delivery, content, you name it? Who would like to take that first? No one? Anybody out there? <laughs> How do we rank? I think we're number two. In the region, Australia is number one, I believe, in terms of uh, adopting VR, surprisingly, maybe, uh, to some of you, but, but the amount of VR companies and production companies and, and innovation that's coming out of Australia is amazing, I think. Uh, but Singapore is just catching up with them, and we have, again, a Singapore company doing business in Australia, which we're quite proud of, uh, because I, I do see Australia as... Yeah. Do you, do you agree? I think, uh, I think what we're seeing is Japan's way ahead of everyone else. Um, so the office in Japan has been around for two years and the um, thinking from clients and also the, the experiences coming out of there are really uh, leading the way in this region. Um, I think Singapore is catching up, to be honest, from an AR point of view. Um, I don't, can't speak obviously for VR, but from an AR point of view, I think it's catching up. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm honestly not too sure about where Singapore ranks in the region. Um, but for advertising, there is a lot of buzz in like both in the region, both in Singapore, um, China actually surprisingly. I mean, but this was a year ago at least, so a year a couple of years ago. Uh, China did show a lot of interest in uh, augmented reality. Um, uh, Coke did approach me personally for for, for a separate campaign, but uh, they were. I mean, I, I don't know where to be honest. I don't know where Singapore. 
by itself ranks within the region or globally. So I, I'm not sure if I'm the best person to answer. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm a bit like you. I don't really know, but uh, when I, we work a lot with Middle East, and we have lots of uh, funky requests coming from there. There's always more holograms and new technologies. Uh, uh, recently, there is a movie called uh, Hologram for the King. I think that summarizes uh, pretty well the, how, uh, how um, there is an interest in that region, actually. Are our friends from the MDA here? Anybody from the EDB? Put them on the spot. <laughs> Investment, let's talk about that. Where does it need to come from? Is there enough going into the space right now in terms of investment? Behind startups, there's a few startups in the room here. Anyone like to take that? No one has a comment. I think, I think last year we were like, as with, with our older agency, we were uh, they did put a lot of lot of money into VR, uh, AR not so much. I mean, but again, I think that's that's when the kind of hype started going up, right? So, yeah. and advertising has to either make the trend or lead the trend. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, with, do you think there's enough money going into the ecosystem at this point? I guess is the question. <laughs> so what's, what's holding it back then? Um, I think risk aversion, complexity, um, barriers to entry, I think. But I mean, I think, you know, from our experience being here, we, we're having some very good conversations right now with the uh, different agencies across the government to try and uh, utilize that technology. Um, so, um, so yeah, I think watch, watch the space. But, um, but no, I think there needs, to be, there needs to be more innovation in this space and more investment from... Uh, you know, from specifically the Singaporean government and, and back in their smart cities initiative, right? I mean, it's perfect, uh, perfect group of technologies to bring into that space and uh, prove prove its worth within a small city like Singapore, right? So, um, so yeah, so hopefully we see more of that grow as, uh, as the year goes on. Part of this is also going to education as well. So how do you actually build a team of people who can build this type of technology? Why? Open it up. You can take it, Aaron. Oh, I was actually. Are you want to? I have a comment about the investment side of it. I think um, from AR perspective, so sorry, from VR perspective, people still observe what's happening to see which company will stand out, which technology will stand out. Even between the giants, the HTC Vive and Oculus, it's really interesting to see which one will catch uh, will, will catch more attention from from the markets. Uh, there is some delivery issue with Oculus, which really helped Vive, and now there is an open source kind of headset that is going to come out. So. I think people maybe are a bit reluctant to invest before they really know where it's heading, and then we'll see the momentum. Okay, personally, that's what I think. Um, so the going to the question in terms of the capabilities, how you build a team, um, is there enough of enough resources even in this market to be able to support that? Unfortunately, no. By the way, if you are into production and VR uh, filming, please uh, talk to me afterwards. We have a few interesting <coughs> projects, and we don't have videographers, enough videographers. Um, no, so uh, it's not as scary and as hard as people may perceive it, and there are different kind of roles and different kind of uh, um, skills that are required to do that. Um, I don't think there are clear methodologies yet. It's being developed, so uh, when, we, when we actually try to um, certify someone or really get someone on board with that, it's mostly shadowing on the job kind of training. Yeah. Um, I guess there will be certifications along the way. Standardization. Maxime, how do you, uh, I mean, you've got a, you moved into a nice new office. Yeah. Uh, um, actually, I completely agree with you. There is no uh, no standout in, uh, in VR, and that's what is exciting. Actually, when we recruit people, it's because we, we can recruit we can recruit uh, truly creative people who, who, uh, who want to set those standards. You know, it's like a really uncharted territory. Um, so. I would say when we're looking for technical skills, um, the game industry uh, provides a, a huge amount of talents and, uh, and uh, right now there is a, a big attraction for VR. So for us, I would say uh, there is not far from here a, 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 game, a game design school called uh, uh, DigiPen. Uh, so yeah, we recruit a few people from there. Uh, they, are, they have a good training. Um, now, really, uh, apart from that, we're really open to anyone who, Who's ready? Uh, who, who want to venture in, into this uh, this field? Do you guys want to comment on that? Or, uh, you okay? um, 
Yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. I, no. Think, I think that's, that's yeah. sounds about right. Let's turn it to the crowd. Any questions? Quite a few. No one's mentioned Magic Leap yet, and that seems to be the elephant in the room for me because it's headset, it's something else, who knows what it is. I mean, Don, you work for Google, they invest a lot of money, big, big tons of money. Any thoughts? Well, I, I, look, I mean, that, that's. We saw the patents a couple weeks, what, a week ago? I don't know, I got asked that question uh, recently by E27, and it's kind of like, look, there must be something behind it. <laughs> I mean, I haven't seen it. I don't think anybody really has seen it. So I would assume that we're trusting these guys that have all the, uh, uh, you know, obviously the numbers are doing the, they're doing the numbers behind the scenes. They must believe in something. I can't really comment on it from a Google standpoint because again, that's a completely other part of the business. So, yeah, what do you guys think? Is there anything to it? I think you should have said I couldn't, I can't comment. Period without saying it's a different part, and then you know you would have started like this. That's that's how conspiracy I don't have, I don't have any for you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think that's part that goes back to to uh, maybe my statement about people still trying to figure out which direction is the right direction. Because yeah, when Google invests in something, you might want to take one step back and really see where it's going, where, where it's going before. Mm. Yeah. I mean. Uh, I mean, for me, I hope it is going the direction that it looks like it's going. Um, I think it's a huge opportunity for the whole industry, right? Both AR and VR. So, um, yeah, I hope it, it is going to be what it looks like it's going to be. Yeah, yeah more or less the same. I mean, we don't know, right? Like, we can't comment until we know for the most part. The advertising industry is going to be great. I mean, they're going to jump on it, like, even before it's out. So, That's the mystery of it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know much either. I, um, I just saw a photo of the CEO with a, with a little lens in his hand. So uh, I hope that's what you put in front of your eye. Uh, then it would be great because uh, this would be a, a really a real AR device. But if that's not the case, uh, I don't really know what happens. Uh, sorry, I wish I'd that's seen right. it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's anyone else for the question? Yeah. You know, you've seen the uh, demo from HoloLens, you know, uh, that this woman put on a HoloLens and they can basically swap uh, between virtual reality and augmented reality and essentially a lot of the demos that I've seen from VR, they're basically very uh, contained, you know, in the sense that you need somebody to, to, to program the whole video and you're basically limited to that, to that set, right? So there's no possibilities, but, uh, but what we want to see is uh, limitless possibilities, like what we've seen in the video, in the demos. Like you know, you can you can choose your uh, your path when once you're inside that virtual world, right? So what do you think will will need to happen, and how long do you think it will take for us to get there? Uh, do we do we think we need huge advances in artificial intelligence to as well as chips, uh, the computing power for 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 content to, uh, to 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 start creating in limitless ways, you know? I don't really understand which kind of content you're talking about, but uh, I've identified personally two, two types of content. Uh, there is one content which is dynamically generated by a real-time 3 engine, and uh, uh, this one you can evolve uh, as much as you want. Of course, there are some constraints that are set by the, by the designer, but you can move around freely. Normally, you can interact with, uh, um, with objects in certain modalities well, that were set by the designer. And now there is also uh, personally what I don't really like, but uh, it, it, you can see a lot of it. It's uh, uh, 360 videos, uh, and maybe this is what you're referring to. So, uh, and when you when you go in those experiences, there's nothing you can do already. You, you just can see, look around, you know. And quite often, those videos are not so interesting because uh, uh, the director cannot focus on a specific point to tell an interesting story. Um, so, I, I would like to hear more about what you're talking about. Actually, what kind of experience you're describing? So, I mean, there, is it, would it be really possible for a content creator to program all that? I mean, probably a certain set of rules and, you know, a certain set of algorithm, but the thing is, 
the unlimited choice, uh, unlimited content creation uh, based on your decision in that virtual world. It's 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 it's, it's not something that I've seen before. Oh, well, it, it will happen probably. I mean, uh, we'll give you more and more and more freedom, uh, more and more creative freedom. I mean, yeah, as you, as you said, uh, uh, artificial intelligence will grow, uh, computing power will grow, uh, and uh, you will be able to, I mean, applica the applications themselves, I will understand uh, what you want, maybe what you think, uh, and they will, uh, they will adapt to you. Uh, and this will simplify your interaction with the virtual world uh, tremendously. Any other questions? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, hi, good evening. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Wanda. I'm from a local gaming company called Armageddon. Uh, we do gaming peripherals. So this is not actually targeted at gaming, which I'm not too sure how much uh, exposure I have to it because from what I'm hearing, it seems to be slightly limited. Um, but I'll ask anyway. So um, for us, what's really important is mainly two things, um, existence of content, uh, sorry, three things, accessibility and also the practicality of the headset um, or any VR experience and that's mostly what I'm looking into at the moment. Um, the only thing that we've really found to be accessible of uh, reasonable democratic design is the typical like Gear VR, which I find very limited and in terms of content as well, um, the games that we have are quite uh, simplistic, like even more so than Candy Crush. <laughs> so, um, how long do you think it would take for us to move forward? Is there something that I'm not looking at? Um, so, in terms of the accessibility, practicality wise, a lot of the headsets are still very heavy. So, in terms of gaming usage, um, anything you can only use it for about an hour or so, um, and then it gets tiring or you get motion sickness. So, that's the second thing that we are looking at to um, not see. We, we ourselves can't exactly overcome it because we're largely manufacturers. We take existing technologies and um, reproduce it, mass market it. So um, how long do you think it would take basically to get past that, that big heavy headset and you know not being able to get a good audio out of it as well? Um, sorry, what was that point? Oh yeah, accessibility. So um, in terms of it being accessible, um, I'd like to share that um, in our region, Southeast Asia, which is largely where we operate, if the headset costs anything more than about 200 USD, um, it would not to us be considered as accessible in our region. So do you think there's a chance for us to get there or is it just simply impossible because VR is just simply that expensive? So there's a lot of questions there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> which one would you like to focus on first? Maybe the, uh, I think uh, accessibility wise and then experience. Uh, I'll try. Um, so, I, not too long ago, I tried to do a calculation. I was trying to see uh, when would the, the, screen, the screens, you know, the screens that we use in headsets, uh, when, would, when they would be equal to the, to the resolution of the human eye. Uh, and it turned out to be around 2020, okay? And after that, uh, you can expect the, the, the screens to shrink, 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 and, and then you will have uh, devices with a form factor that will be very acceptable. Uh, however, I think this might be completely uh, useless as a, as a study because um, there is so much interest in those technology right now uh, that I'm sure that people will come uh, with solutions that will solve your problem much before that. So uh, I think, re realistically, within the next five years, you are good to go, really. I think with the gaming industry, like, it's, it's not just the headset. I mean, in terms of your accessibility question, it's, it's not just the headset, right? It's like a whole bunch of, you need the controller, you need a whole bunch of other things. And I'm personally not completely sold on the idea. I mean, I know both of you thought, I mean, both of you feel that, uh, that, that games are really, really into <coughs> VR. Uh, and I think, Yes, in a way, definitely. Uh, games and VR, they are kind of, they go hand in hand. Uh, but for the most part, I, I'm, I'm not completely sold. I, I just hope, I mean, I hope that they are. I hope that, that it is It is the case, but I just hope it's also not something like the Kinect. The Kinect was really beautiful, 2005 or something, it came out. And we don't use it anymore. Like, that's just, I, maybe gamers are lazy, I don't know. Like, you know, that's, we, we, we really need to think, think this through, I think. I mean, it, there is a, a very niche, 
kind of uh, market or a niche kind of um, gamers who, 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 who do still use the Kinect and who will definitely be using VR. Uh, and, and for them, accessibility is not a problem because they are kind of, they want it, so they will take it anyway, right? So that's, I, I, I don't know, in terms of accessibility, if, if they are your target, you're going to get your target anyway, I think. I mean, for, from processing power and, and, and the capability of the screen quality and such, I think if I were in the gaming industry, I would have looked at the mobile phones and at the PCs as two different kind of uh, platforms for game development. So I think it makes more sense in a way at the moment to look at the Oculus and the Vive and the PC-oriented kind of VR as more suitable for advanced games. Um, in terms of, uh, of mobile phone, I, I read yesterday, I think, that the SA, Samsung SA that will be released early next year will have a very, very advanced screen. So, and the processors will get better and better. So, at the moment, I would expect PCs and Oculus and, and uh, HTC Vive to be more supportive when it comes to increasing processing power naturally. I think we got time for one question. <laughs> and that gentleman actually was the, had his hand up before, so I think he got dibs. Go ahead, unless you want to share. All right. Right. Um, just mainly my name is Mohan, and I actually mainly do uh, production, but I'm digressing into a bit of 360 video. So this question is pretty much targeted to Takanto. Um, with a lot of new pro con pro consumer products matching up with mainly 360 GoPro rigs, how do you differentiate yourself from? Uh, that production because it's it's big price difference. True, that, that, that's a very good question. That's a question we really ask ourselves frequently. I would say you can look at it from, from a video camera perspective. You know, everyone can buy a high-end video camera. Can everyone open a production company? I don't think so, maybe, but... So there is not really a lot of competition even though high-end cameras can be uh, purchased quite cheaply today by everyone you still have specialized studios around that. However, having said that, I do think um, production companies will have to think about the added value they bring at the next level. So, for example, you can look now at the, at the cameras as mostly monoscopic, so maybe the next phase will be stereoscopic. This will be the standard for production companies. So, you know, try to really be ahead of their game, in a way. Adding a layer of interactivity, so it's not just about capturing a video, it's also about adding some uh, interactive elements on top of it. Um, but at the end, I think we'll find ourselves in a situation which is similar to video cameras today and production companies today. Okay. Uh, we're gonna wrap it up there because we're heading close to eight and there's probably some people in here that are hungry. Um, one last bit, we'll go around the, the, the team here and ask your crystal ball sort of projection <coughs> the next year where we're gonna be with VR and AR. One last sort of statement or summary. You want to give her? I don't know, but I just hope that we'll see uh, what Magic Leap is all about. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, I'm still waiting for Magic Leap as well. Um, I think VR is still going to be, uh, still going to have the edge over AR. Uh, I still do like AR, to be honest, over VR. But, uh, but yeah, and I, I think that's that's basically my take. Flipping or using uh, augmented reality and artificial intelligence technologies um, becomes more ubiquitous, um, and um, yeah, and that's what, what we're driving towards. So um, yeah, that will be my prediction. I think in the next 12 months, that will be uh, there will be a lot more hands come up when you uh, ask people, Are you, "Have you blipped in the last week?" For example, I think and I hope in a way that social VR will really get a lot of momentum a year from now. Um, which will really ensure that VR will stay alive outside of the gaming industry. Um, and also, I do believe that we'll see um, a combination of VR and AR. It just has to happen at some point, you know, just being able to just switch between the two experiences using one headset. Yeah. I'd agree. I'd like to see that happen. It just seems like it would be more of a, a heightened experience. I think what I would like to see is, you know, my parents live so far away and they're, they're Years old, and they're not going to be able to travel to Singapore and see my six and three-year-old sons at all. I would like to see it someday evolve to a point where 
I can transport them more into that environment <laughs> that my kids are in and they can realize that just how much havoc they cause. Um, but, you know, experience that enrich sort of grow up with them. But they don't have that right now. They're not going to be able to travel over it. I think that's what VR could, could potentially be or AR could add to that as well. So that's my wish. That If I had a wish, that would be it. Um, maybe Magic Leap, sure, I'd love to see that too. But that's number one. Get them here somehow. Um, so I just want to thank the panelists. And before we break, um, there's some announcements I want to go through. But can we give them a round of applause, please? So again, thanks everyone, gentlemen. Gentlemen, thanks so much for your opinions on this too as well. Um, some final notes. And again, thank you to the uh, NUS Enterprise for uh, again giving us this venue. Um, Expera Ventures is hosting a hackathon in partnership with National Computing Center. Anyone interested should reach out to Lee or Amy Doe for more information. And I think they're in here or will be around. So Amy, if you're here, if you could raise your hand if you aren't. You'll have to hunt people down yourselves. Look for announcement on the Facebook group page too as well. Um, I think it's Madge's Institute of Excellence. Anyone from there? From that instance? There we are. Um, uh, which focuses on game design, animation, uh, is launching a course on game development plus VR. MBA grants are available, correct? Um, speak to Alexander if you'd like more information after the session. He's right over there. Okay. Um, Roy, where is Roy? Roy! <laughs> Thank you for being so kind with the mic tonight. Roy has Google Cardboards, if anyone is interested too as well. And we're working on some other meetups too as well. Look for the, uh, just follow our meetup board, uh, follow, up the face, uh, follow our Facebook group as well. And uh, I'm allowed to say that even if I work for Google. Um, and again, final thanks to, uh, to all our companies that are demoing tonight. And thank you for your support. We'll see you hopefully in another month or two. Cheers.